Today, we hear the cross-examination in court of Lucy Letby. Mr Johnson says Letby was a mentor to students. Letby gives details of what that would involve. Mr Johnson asks for paperwork. What would their responsibilities be? If one of them was given a handover sheet, what would they do with it? Letby says they would dispose of it, although student nurses would not have handover sheets in the first place. Mr Johnson asks why Letby kept bringing handover sheets home. Letby said it was a few. Mr Johnson responds, well, 250 times it isn't. Letby replies, well, that is over many years. Mr Johnson responds, well, even if it's 50, that's over five years. What is your normal practice? Letby replies, with the handover sheets, to dispose of them. They have come home with me. Mr Johnson replies, you have taken them home. Letby responds, not with the intent of keeping them. Mr Johnson says what would Letby's responsibilities be with sensitive data such as handover sheets? Letby replies, to keep it confidential. Mr Johnson asks what would the hospital do in disciplinary terms if they found Letby had 250 handover sheets at her home? Letby replies, I don't know the full details. They were at my home address but they were held in confidence. In a bag in your garage? Letby replies, I was the only one in the house. Johnson responds, and the ones in your parents' house? Letby says the parents would not have access to the box in what would have been her bedroom. Mr Johnson replies, do you obey the rules when it suits you? Letby responds, no. Mr Johnson asks if handover sheets were handed out to student nurses. Letby said she would have handover sheets as a student nurse at some placements, but in the neonatal unit she cannot recall specifically. She tells the court it was not standard practice at the neonatal unit to hand out handover sheets to student nurses. Mr Johnson says one of the handover sheets, dated the 1st of June 2010, was in a keepsake box with roses on it. Letby says she cannot recall it. Mr Johnson asks what is unusual about the handover sheet and how it differs from the others. Letby is unsure what Mr Johnson means. Mr Johnson replies, it is in pristine condition. Letby responds, it's the original. Mr Johnson replies, yes. Mr Johnson says Letby took the sheet for June 23, 2016 home as it had notes of drugs for child O and child P. Letby said there was documentation on there but cannot be sure what details were on it. Letby said she took the note home deliberately to bring it back the following day for finishing up writing of medications. A copy of the handover sheet is circulated to the jury and Letby. Mr Johnson says he is interested in the back on the medical notes. Letby describes what is on the note. Medication for child P, caffeine. Nothing was written for child O. No medications were noted for a third child. Letby said she had taken it back with the paper towel, which had further details. Letby is asked when the Morrison's work bag was placed under her bed. Letby says she cannot recall. The Ibiza bag became her new bag after her trip to Ibiza around June 2016. Letby is asked how the handover sheets ended up in her bag. She says after emptying her pockets, the sheets would end up in her work bag. Nicholas Johnson you're ferrying worksheets to and from work. Let be. I can't say definitively. Nicholas Johnson. They must have been. Why put them in that bag at all? Let be. I, I can't recall. Nicholas Johnson. Can't or won't. Lucy Letby. They were just bits of paper to me. Letby says she accepts pieces of paper were taken between different areas and properties. Quote, it's the paper I accumulate, not the content. Letby says she has difficulty throwing things away. Nicholas Johnson. Is that why you bought a shredder? Lucy Letby replies. I bought a shredder for certain documents when I bought the house. Predominantly bank statements. Nicholas Johnson. Why not the handover sheets? Lucy Letby. I wasn't aware I had them. I wasn't thinking. They were just bits of paper. Mr Johnson says the shredder was bought after Letby moved into her Chester home in April 2016. Lucy Letby replies, they were insignificant. Nicholas Johnson, they are significant. 
They have the names of dead children on them. Lucy Letby. They have the names of lots of children on them. I agree. I shouldn't have taken them home. Mr Johnson asks about other work documents found in Letby's Morrison's work bag, such as a blood gas record for child M. Nicholas Johnson. Were they insignificant? Letby says at the time the documents were insignificant as they went home along with a lot of other documents for babies not on the indictment. Lucy Letby. These have come home with me, not with any intention. Nicholas Johnson. You have taken them home. Letby accepts the wording. Mr Johnson asks if Letby recalls a colleague nurse's evidence for child M on the blood gas reading. Mr Johnson says she took it, wrote it on the chart and disposed of it. Letby is asked how she got the sheet, if it had been put in the hospital's confidential waste bin. Lucy Letby. I can't recall specifically. Nicholas Johnson. It was for your little collection, wasn't it? Lucy Letby. No. Mr Johnson asks why Letby purchased a shredder if she wasn't going to use it. Was she on so much money she could make such purchases? Letby, after saying she's not sure what finances has to do with this, she says she used a shredder to shred bank statements. Why did you lie about not having a shredder in interview? Letby said she didn't recall having a shredder. It was not a significant item in her house. Like the pieces of paper? Letby agrees. Letby, when asked how she could have disposed of handover sheets, said to police in interview she did not have a shredder and if she did, that would be how she would dispose of confidential documents. Letby tells the court, quote, I can't recall at the time I'd just been arrested by the police. Locating a shredder wasn't on my mind. Mr Johnson asks when the shredder was bought. Letby says, shortly before this police interview, if I said it was bought recently. Mr Johnson asks about a shredder box in Letby's parents' home, in her bedroom wardrobe. Letby said, quote, It probably moved with me. She says she cannot recall definitively whether it was her parents' shredder. Mr Johnson says it was settled that the box had the word keep written on it. Letby said that was to keep the box and the shredder. Mr Johnson, but there is no shredder in the box. Letby, the shredder was elsewhere in the house. Letby agrees her parents would not go in her room at their parents' place. Mr Johnson asks why the word keep would be written on the box in that event. Lucy Letby, I can't answer that. Mr Johnson asks about a sympathy card written to Child Eye's family. Letby is asked where she wrote the card. Letby says she bought the card but cannot recall where specifically she wrote it. Letby says she wouldn't have written it on shift. Letby is asked why the photo was taken when she was at work. Letby replies, the card is written, it has been taken to work to hand over to a colleague who is going to the funeral. Nicholas Johnson, why did you take a picture at the place where the child died in dreadful circumstances? Letby said the place the photo was taken was insignificant. It was taken before the card was handed over to staff. Mr Johnson, another thing that is insignificant. Letby replies, I think that that is taken out of context. Mr Johnson, did it give you a bit of a thrill? Lucy Letby, absolutely not. Mr Johnson says in the defence, Letby's name is not referred to in the schedule surrounding the events for some babies. Are you suggesting the absence of your name from the schedule is showing you hadn't had contact with the child? Letby agrees in terms of the documentation at that time. She agrees that does not record events such as minor nursing responses if a baby starts crying. Letby says she has been to the unit on days off, such as finishing documentation that hasn't been done in the day or seeing colleagues who have been on a course. Letby says a record would be made as the swipe data would record her entrance as the only way she could get into the unit. Mr Johnson says for child G, Letby did not leave work until 10am on September the 7th. Letby replies, that's not unusual. A message is shown from 10.56pm on September the 7th. Letby, she looks awful doesn't she? Hope you get some sleep. Letby said if there was a sick baby on the unit quote, you would go and check on them, that's not unreasonable. She had looked at Child G's charts and accepts she was not on duty at that time. 
Letby said she had been in to finish some documentation. Mr Johnson tells the court this was a big day for child G, as it was her 100th day. Letby said, quote, yeah, she's declining bit by bit. Mr Johnson says there is no record of Letby entering the unit. He suggests Letby does not need a pass to gain entry to the unit. Letby says she would need a pass to swipe in and accepts unless another colleague opened the door for me. Letby adds if she had a legitimate reason to enter the unit, she would have entry accepted. Letby is asked why she entered the unit at around 11pm, not earlier that day. Letby, it's quieter at night, I don't know, I can't say why I've gone in at night. Mr Johnson asks to clarify an issue relating to nasogastric tube feeds. Letby explains to the court how an NG tube feed is administered to a baby. Nicholas Johnson, have you ever used a plunger syringe to speed up the flow of milk? Letby, no. Nicholas Johnson, have you ever sent text to your friend while giving an NGT feed? Letby, no. Letby says that would be inappropriate and impractical. She says the times on the feed charts would be done to the next 15 minutes, such as for 9am that feed would be between 8.45 and 9.15am. Letby says she has never used her phone in a clinical area. She says the baby would take priority over texting her friends or colleagues. She says she has not texted anyone while a resuscitation is taking place on the unit, one that she was involved in. Letby said she would not provide commentary during a resuscitation. Mr Johnson asks about staffing levels. Letby agrees that babies in room 1 are not necessarily always intensive care babies or that babies in room 2 are always high dependency babies. Mr Johnson says if the jury conclude a baby was attacked, then it would be the attacker who was the common link. Letby replies, just because I was on the shift doesn't mean I have done anything. Mr Johnson says if the jury conclude attacks happened in four cases, then the common link between them all would be the attacker. Letby, that is for them to decide. Nicholas Johnson, on principle, do you agree? Letby, I don't think I can answer that. Mr Johnson asks about Letby's colleagues. Letby says she did not have a disagreement with Dr Gail Beach or Dr Andrew Brunton and had a good working relationship with them. For Dr Stephen Breary, Letby said she did not have a problem with him at the time she was at work with him. She wrote a note calling him a profanity after she was redeployed as he and Dr Ravi Jayram had been making comments about Letby being implicated in the deaths of babies. Quote, They were very insistent that I be removed from the unit. Letby denies being in love with a doctor who cannot be named. Quote, I loved him as a friend. I was not in love with him. A note in Letby's handwriting is shown to the court. There is a suggestion the writing, previously said as, quote, Timmy, is Tiny Boy. Letby says her dog as a child had a nickname of Tiny Boy, while another of her childhood dogs was named Timmy. Letby said she had no issues with other doctors on the unit, including Dr John Gibbs, Dr Sally Ogden, Dr Alison Ventress and Dr David Harkness. For one other doctor, she said she did not have the best working relationship, but they got on. For Dr Ravi Jayram, quote, we had a normal working relationship. Nicholas Johnson, you searched for him on the internet. Letby, I searched for a lot of people. Letby says four doctors were in the conspiracy group, including Dr Jayram, Dr Gibbs and Dr Breary, quote, that they have apportioned blame on me. Letby is asked about failings in the hospital. Letby is asked if child E was poisoned with insulin. Quote, yes, I agree that he had insulin. Do you believe that somebody gave it to him unlawfully? Yes. Do you believe that someone targeted him? No. It was a random act? Yes, I, I don't know where the insulin came from. Do you agree child L was poisoned with insulin? From the blood results, yes. Do you agree that someone targeted him specifically? No, I don't know how the insulin got there. Letby adds, I don't believe any member of the staff on the unit would make a mistake in giving insulin. The judge asks if that is the case for child E. Letby agrees. She denies it was her who administered the insulin.
Let B is asked about the dangers of unprescribed insulin. Let B. It would cause them to be unwell. It would cause them to be hyperglycemic, seizures, apnea, even death. Let B is asked about her training, which, when completed, allowed her to care for intensive care babies. Let B is asked if that meant she would have access to room one more often than before. Let B agrees. The training involved education about lines, access and the complication of air embolus, the court hears. Let B said she had heard of air embolus by the time police interviewed her. She tells the court, all staff know that air introduced can lead to death. Nicholas Johnson, everybody knows the danger of air embolus. Lucy Let B, I can't speak for everyone. Mr Johnson asks about the case of child A. Let me say she did have independent memory of child A. Before child A, had you ever known a child to die unexpectedly within 24 hours of birth? Let be. I can't recall. I'm not sure. Let me says she can recall two or three baby deaths prior at the Countess of Chester Hospital and several at her placement in Liverpool Women's Hospital. Mr Johnson says Let me had previously told police it was two at Liverpool. Letby says her memory would have been clearer back then. Letby says it was discussed at the time child A's antiphospholipid syndrome could have been a contributing factor at the time. Letby tells the court, in part, staffing levels were a contributing part in child A's death due to a lack of fluids for four hours and issues with the UVC line. She says they were contributing factors and put child A at increased risk of collapse. I can't tell you how child A died, but there were contributing factors that were missed. Letby says the issues with child A's lines made him more vulnerable, with one of the lines not being connected to anything. Letby is asked why she didn't record this on the Datix form. Letby replies, it was discussed amongst staff at the time. I didn't feel the need to do a Datix. It had been raised verbally with two senior staff, one Dr Jram and one senior nursing staff. She adds, I don't know why child A died. Letby says if the cause of death was established as air embolus, then it would have to come from the person connecting the fluids, which wasn't me. Nicholas Johnson, do you accept you were by child A at the time he collapsed? Letby. I accept that I was in his cot space checking equipment. Yes, I was in his close vicinity. Nicholas Johnson. Could you reach out and touch him? Let be. I could touch his incubator. The incubator was closed. Nicholas Johnson. Could you touch his lines? Let be. No. Let be says there's no way of knowing from the signatures who administered the medication between the two nurses. Let be or nurse Melanie Taylor. Dr David Harkness recalled to the court, quote, There was a very unusual patchiness of the skin, which I have never seen before and only seen since in cases at the Countess of Chester Hospital. Letby disagrees with that skin colour description for child A. She agrees with Dr Harkness that child A had mottling with purple and white patches. Letby says she cannot recall any blotchiness. I didn't see it. If he says he saw it, that's for him to justify. It's not something I saw. I was present and I did not see those. Dr Ravi Jayram said child A was pale, very pale, and referred to unusual patches of discoloration. Let be. I don't agree with the description of discoloration. I agree he was pale. Let be disagrees with the description of child A being blue, with pink patches flitting around. An experienced nurse of 20 years, who the court hears was a friend of Letby, said, quote, I've never seen a baby look that way before. He looked very ill. Letby agrees child A looked ill. She disagrees with the nurse's statement of the discoloration or the blotchiness on child A's skin. I agree he was white with what looked like purple markings. Letby agrees with the statement that the colouring came on very suddenly. Mr Johnson refers to Letby's police interview in which Letby was asked to interpret what she had seen on child A. Letby explained to police Motling was blotchy red markings on the skin, like reddy purple. Child A was centrally pale. In police interview, Letby was asked about what she saw on child A. 
She said, I think from memory, the mottling was more on the side the line was in. I think it was his left. Letby tells the court she felt child A was more pale than mottled. She says it was unusual for child A to be pale and to have discoloration on the side, but there was nothing unusual about the type of discoloration itself. Mr Johnson asks about the bag being kept for testing. Letby says she cannot recall if she followed up if the bag was tested. She had handed it over to the shift leader. Letby is asked if she accepts child A did not have a normal respiratory problem. Letby agrees. Mr Johnson asks if Letby has ever seen an arrhythmia in a neonate. Letby replies, no, I don't think so, no. Mr Johnson says air bubbles were found in child A afterwards. Did you inject child A with air? No. Mr Johnson asks if Letby was keen to get back to room 1 after this event. Letby says from her experience at Liverpool Women's Hospital, she was taught to get back and carry on as soon as possible. Letby had been asked what the dangers of air embolus were, and she had not known. Were you playing daft? No, every nurse knows the dangers. Letby said she did not know how an air embolus would progress, but knew the ultimate risk was death. The trial is now resuming after a lunch break. Nicholas Johnson KC says there is one thing he overlooked from the morning's evidence. He asks Lucy Letby why she said blotchiness rather than mottling in part of her police statement. I think they are interchangeable, Letby tells the court. Asked if staffing levels or mistakes had contributed to the collapse of child B, Letby says she does not know what caused child B's collapse. She says she does not recall child B's father lying on the floor following child B's collapse. A text message from Let B includes, Dad was on the floor crying, saying please don't take our baby away when I took him to the mortuary. It's just heartbreaking. Let B says she does not recall that. Let B says in this case, she did not want to care for child B so soon after the death of child A as unlike the Liverpool example, she had been taught of getting back on the horse, Mr Johnson's words, and being back in nursery room one. This was with the same family. Letby accepts child B did well on the day shift of June 9th. Letby is asked if child B's parents stood guard in the unit following the death of twin child A. Letby. They were very much present on the unit and we allowed for that. A diagram for the night shift of June 9th 10th shows Letby was in nursery room 3 for that night shift, looking after two babies. Child B was in room 1. Letby says she got on well with all her nursing colleagues. Letby recalls evidence from court by a nurse colleague on March 21st, in which Letby had said working in nurseries 3 and 4 was, quote, boring. Letby tells the court, I have never been bored at work. I would never describe my work as boring. Mr Johnson goes through the timeline of child B's events. A message from Let B to Yvonne Griffiths said, quote, Hard coming in and seeing the parents. Mr Johnson says she is engaged in chit-chat with a friend between 8.41 to 9.10pm on the night shift in a social context. Let B says that sort of conversation was not limited to just her. Mr Johnson says further messages are exchanged between 9.12 to 9.32pm. Letby says all members of staff use their phones on the unit. She says it was accepted. She says she cannot comment for the whole unit, but her designated babies were being cared for. She says she does not believe there were staffing issues. I can't see what's going on with the other babies at this time, she said. Further messages are exchanged involving Letby, some in a social context, up to 10.28pm. Mr Johnson says in the middle of the block of messages, Letby signs for medication for a baby at 10.20pm. Letby says she didn't use her phone in clinical areas. A further block of messages are exchanged on Letby's phone between 10.38 to 10.59pm. Nicholas Johnson. Were you bored? Letby. No. Nicholas Johnson. As a matter of fact, do you text a lot when in room free? Let be. I text regardless of where I am on shift. Nicholas Johnson. Even with an ITU baby in room one? Let be. 
Yes, and I think everyone else would say the same if they were honest. Letby says she was working in Nursery 1 at points during the shift. She accepts that following Child B's collapse, she was in Room 1. A document for a TPN bag and lipid administration is signed by Letby at 11.40pm on June 9th. Letby says an observation form at what appears to be 10 past midnight has what Letby accepts could be her handwriting. It is similar to the writing in the next column which is initialled by Letby. A blood gas record is shown for 12.16am. Letby accepts she is there at that time as two nurses are needed to carry out the test. Letby says she was unsure whether she or a colleague had alerted the other to child B's deterioration. Letby, I can't sit here and say definitively which way now, no. Nicholas Johnson, you injected child B with air, didn't you? Letby, no, I didn't. Mr Johnson asks about child B's appearance. Letby had earlier told her defence child B became quite mottled, dark all over. Letby was asked if she had seen that mottling before. Yes, it was like general mottling that we do see on babies, adding, it was not unusual, but it was a concern, in light of child A's decline the night before. Letby tells the court the mottling was more pronounced than usually found. In police interview, Letby had said the mottling was more than seen on child A, who was pale centrally. It was darker. Letby also said there was a rash appearance. Letby tells the court it was a more pronounced mottling, but was still mottling. Nicholas Johnson, are you saying this was normal? Letby says it was not normal, but something which would be seen. It was more pronounced than general mottling. She says it came very quickly, and in the context of child A, everyone acted very quickly. Mr Johnson asks why a doctor asked for someone to get a camera. Letby. In view of what had happened to child A the night before, we did not want to take any chances. Child B's mother describes the mottling event, and the consultant had, quote, never seen this before, and the mother was surprised at this. Do you accept what child A and B's mother said? Let B. I accept there was mottling, yes. She says she does not recall the consultant saying that she was not there when it was said. Letby tells the court she went immediately to get a camera, and when she returned, the mottling had gone. A doctor had said child B was a very pale, dusky colour, and then developing widespread blotches, patches of purpley red colour. Letby said she was not there at that point, as she may have been getting the camera. She says she did not see that on child B. She says no conversation was ever had about that. The judge asked if there was anything that could have led to the doctor to be mistaken in her description. Letby replies, no, I just saw mottling. Letby says the mottling was purply red. Another doctor had described a blotchiness to one side. Letby says she did not take over care of child B from a senior nurse of 20 years experience. She says the senior nurse was busy with the family. The court is shown Let B is a co-signer for a number of medications following Child B's collapse with the senior nurse. Let B denies suggesting antiphospholipid syndrome was a cause of Child B's death. Mr Johnson asks if Let B accepts Child A and Child B had air administered. Let B replies, no. Mr Johnson turns to the case of Child C. Let B is asked to look at her defence statement. Let me recall she did not believe she was in room 1 and cannot recall how she ended up in room 1. Possibly it was a result of child C's alarm going off. Let B in her statement said she had been involved in speaking to the family afterwards but not to the extent child C's mother had said. Mr Johnson said a nurse had given evidence to say Let B had to be removed from the family room after child C died. Mr Johnson says Letby's vague recollection of events is untrue. Letby, I don't agree with that. Nicholas Johnson, I'm going to suggest you enjoyed what happened and that is why you were in the family room. Letby, no. Letby is asked why she did not remember Child C in police interview. Letby says she remembered once provided with further details. She adds... I don't know how Child C died. 
She rules out staffing levels, medical incompetencies, or someone making a mistake. Mr. Johnson says this is a case where one of the nursing notes by Yvonne Griffiths was misfiled to a different baby, and was, after child C died, refiled back to child C. Mr. Johnson asks Letby if nursing notes, timestamped by their start and end, are editable. Letby replies, no. The court hears because of this the note had to be re-entered into the system. The rewritten note is shown to the court. The note is for the June 12th day shift. It includes no apneas noted and caffeine given as prescribed. Long line inserted by Dr. Beach on second attempt. Child C unsettled at times, soothes with pacifier and enjoyed kangaroo skin to skin care with parents. A nursing note by Joanne Williams is shown to the court for Child C on the day shift. Child C very unsettled and fractious. Child C taken off CPAP while out having skin to skin with mummy. Calm down straight away with mummy. Let be agrees this was a positive picture for Child C. Child C was on CPAP breathing support to 10am, then was taken off it for a couple of hours, then was on Optiflow breathing support for the rest of his life. Mr. Johnson moves on to the shift in which Letby was present. A shift rotor is shown to the court, showing Letby was looking after two babies that night on June 13th. She was in nursery room 3, with child C in room 1 that night. Mr. Johnson says this was another shift when Letby had migrated to room 1. Letby replies, yes, in response to child C's care needs. She says she has no recollection of going to see Child C prior to his collapse. Letby says she was unhappy at being in room 3 for that shift, as opposed to room 1, but that was the decision of the prior shift leader. Letby's nursing colleague had said Letby's designated baby in room 3 needed attention, after Letby had asked if she could be redeployed to room 1 that night. Letby replies, yes, they did need attention and I gave them attention. Letby had sent a message to Jennifer Jones Key, quote, I just keep thinking about Monday. Feel I need to be in room one to overcome it. But colleagues said no. Jennifer Jones Key. I agree with her. Don't think it will help. You need a break from full-on ITU. You have to let it go or it will eat you up. I know not easy and will take time. Lucy Letby. Not the vented baby necessarily. I just feel I need to be in one to get the image out of my head. Mella said the same and colleague let her go. Being in three is eating me up. All I can see is him in one. It probably sounds odd, but it's how I feel. Jennifer Jones Key. Well, it's up to you, but don't think it's going to help. It sounds very odd and I would be complete opposite. Can understand colleague trying to look after you. Lucy Letby. Well, that's how I feel. From when I've experienced it at women's, I've needed to go straight back and have a sick baby. Otherwise, the image of the one you lost never goes. Why send Mel in if she's trying to look after us? She was in bits over it. Don't expect people to understand, but I know how I feel and how I've dealt with it before. I've voiced that, so can't do any more, but people should respect that. Jennifer Jones Key. Okay. Jennifer Jones Key. I think they do respect it, but also trying to help you. Why don't you go in one for a bit? Lucy Letby. Yeah, I've done a couple of meds in one. I'll be fine. Jennifer Jones Key. It didn't sound like you would be. Sorry, was eating my tea. Lucy Letby. Forget I said anything. I'll be fine. It's part of the job. Just don't feel like there's much team spirit tonight. Jennifer Jones Key. I'm not going to forget, but just think you're way too hard on yourself. It is part of the job, but the worst part. But I do believe it makes us stronger people. Lucy Letby. Unfortunately, I've seen my fair share at women, so you're supported differently. And here, it's like people want to tell you how to think and feel. Anyway, onwards and upwards. Just a shame I'm on with Mel and colleague. Sophie in one, so haven't got her to talk to either. Jennifer Jones Key. Work is work. A lot of the girls say women's don't support and tell them to get on with it. I think they don't mean to tell you though and were over caring sometimes. Yeah, that's not good, but you got Liz. Lucy Letby. Women's can be awful, but I learnt the hard way that you have to speak up to get support. I lost a baby one day, and a few hours later was given another dying baby just born in the same cot space. Girls there said it was important to overcome the image. It was awful, but by the end of the day, I realised they were right. It's just different here. 
Anyway, forget it. I can only talk about it properly to those who knew him and Mel not interested, so I'll overcome it myself. You get some sleep. Lebby accepts there were two babies in room one, but does not accept she was specifically wanting to look after child C. Lebby tells the court, it wasn't about me wanting to get my own way. Lebby accepts she was upset, just generally, that her feelings weren't being considered by a colleague and Melanie Taylor. Mr Johnson interjects and asks if this was the Melanie Taylor who Letby had said potentially caused a child's death. Letby replies, potentially, yes. Jennifer Jones Key. That's a bit mean, isn't it? Don't have to know him to understand. We've all been there. Yep, off to bed now. Lucy Letby. I don't mean it like that. Just only those who saw him know what image I have in my head. Forget it. I'm obviously making more of it than I should. Letby tells the court she had hoped Jennifer Jones Key would have been more understanding to how she was feeling, and was frustrated, and the conversation was not going anywhere, so she wanted to leave the conversation. Letby says her colleague Sophie Ellis was the least experienced member of staff on that shift and did not have the skills for the job of looking after small premature babies in room one. I did not think she was qualified for the job. She did not have the skills for premature babies in room one. She denies that Sophie Ellis did anything to cause child C's collapse. Mr Johnson asks, she had something you wanted. Letby replied, no. The court hears Sophie Ellis's statement saying when she entered room one, Letby was by child C's cot side saying, quote, he's just dropped, his heart rate saturations, or words to that effect. The court is shown a neonatal schedule for the night shift of June 13th, 14th, 2015. Letby is shown recording observations for her designated babies and made medication prescriptions for babies not in room one. Letby says the medications for those babies would have been drawn up in room one. Quote, they could not have been done in a special care nursery. Letby says if Sophie Ellis has documented correctly, there would have been no air in child C's stomach after an aspiration was made for the baby's feed. Letby denies taking, in Mr Johnson's words, an opportunity to sabotage child C. In police interview, it is put to Letby that child C collapsed six minutes after she sent the last of her text messages. Letby states, I don't recall where I was at the time. Letby says she may have been in a nursing station before going into room one. Letby said she did not recall being cotside, but accepted Sophie Ellis's account at the time it was put to her by the police. The death of Child C was very memorable, wasn't it? Yes. Nicholas Johnson KC for the prosecution is continuing to cross-examine and is asking Lucy Letby questions in the case of Child C. Mr Johnson says text messages were exchanged between Letby and her colleague Jennifer Jones Key between 11.01 and 11.09pm. Letby says she does not accept she was in room one at the time of child C's collapse. She says she has no memory of it. Nurse Sophie Ellis had said she was in room one at the time and Letby said in police interview based on that that she was indeed in room one. Letby says she disputes that as she has no memory of it. Do you dispute being born? Mr Johnson asks. No, Letby replies. But you have no memory of it? Letby replies, no. Letby is asked why she let a band for nursery nurse look after her designated baby. Letby says it's not unusual for band for nurses to assist her in her duties. Letby, I have no memory of that. Nicholas Johnson, did you have something better to do? Letby, no. Mr Johnson says the text at 11.01pm sent by Letby to Jennifer Jones Key meant she must not have been in a clinical area and would not have had time to feed her designated baby in room three. Letby, I can't answer that. Mr Johnson says it took her out of the nursing area. Letby said she would have been in the doorway of the unit. Mr Johnson says Melanie Taylor in evidence described Letby as cool and calm. Letby does not dispute that. She disputes saying to Melanie Taylor that Child C had had a braddy, as she has no memory of it. Notes by Dr Catherine Davis are shown to the court for Child C's collapse. At the time of arrival, quote, chest compressions in progress, occasional intermittent gasps noted. 
and able to pass ET tube as chords plus plus. The court hears the chords were swollen. Mr Johnson asks Letby if it was a theme that when doctors went to intubate they had difficulties with swollen cords and or bleeding. Letby accepts that was the case. She denies putting anything down Child C's throat. Mr Johnson, do you agree something caused Child C's stomach to dilate before the collapse? Letby says the stomach dilation could have been caused by the Neopuff resuscitation. Letby is asked if she had seen the kind of decline as seen by Child C before. Letby says she has, but not the way Child C cling to life. Nicholas Johnson, you enjoyed the aftermath of this, didn't you? Letby, no. Why were you so keen to spend time with Child C's family as they cradled their dying child? Letby, I don't agree with that. I wasn't there a lot of the time. Letby disputes being repeatedly in the family room afterwards, adding, quote, I don't recall my colleague having to pull me out of there. She disputes the statement made by her colleague. Letby is asked what useful function she was contributing to the family during the dreadful situation they were going through. Letby said she cannot recall, other than gathering the mementos, which is a two-person job. Letby says she would have to see the bereavement checklist charts to see if there was anything she had co-signed, as otherwise she does not recall and has no memory. The judge asks if hand and footprints are collected when the baby is still alive. Letby replies they can be, or after they have passed. Letby denies that she was enjoying what was going on. Mr Johnson now moves on to the case of Child D. Letby's defence statement said she did not believe she had any involvement with Child D until the baby girl's collapse. Letby says she was affected by Child D's death, as were all the staff on the unit. In police interview, Letby said she could not recall Child D. Letby recalls looking after two babies in room one on the night of June 21st, 22nd. Caroline Oakley was the designated nurse for Child D and the baby in room two. Letby accepts from time to time she would have been alone in room one as Caroline Oakley split her time caring for the two babies between the two rooms. Part of a statement from Child D's mother is read out. Letby disputes she was the nurse who held a phone to Dr Brunton's ear while resuscitation efforts were going on. Letby says she can recall there was such an incident as it was talked about after the event. She agrees it happened, but she disagrees it was her who made the phone call. Mr Johnson asks about a series of Countess nursing staff's descriptions of the unusual skin discoloration and an odd rash. Some of them said it was something they had not seen before. Letby says she does not dispute the staff's descriptions. Nicholas Johnson. Do you still not remember Child D? Letby. I didn't recall at the time of my police interview. No. Do you remember her now? Yes. Do you remember the circumstances surrounding her death? No. Letby messaged a colleague on June 22nd. Child D came out in this weird rash, looking like overwhelming sepsis. Letby said she had not seen the type of rash before, but she had seen something similar in her training years before. The message added, quote, then collapsed and had full recess, so upsetting for everyone. Parents absolutely distraught, dad screaming. Mr Johnson asks if Letby was lying to police when she said she didn't remember Child D. Letby replies, no. Letby's text message added, quote, Andrew Brunton and Liz Newby said it will probably be investigated. Hmm, well it's happened and that's it. Got to carry on. Mr Johnson said he had earlier asked if that was Letby's reaction to Child D's death. Letby replies, I don't think it was meant in the context you are suggesting. We've got to move forward. It's not meant to be any insensitivity to the parents or Child D. Mr Johnson asks about the Facebook search for Child D's mother on June 25th, 2015. He asks how she remembers the name of Child D's mother if she did not recall Child D in police interview in 2018. Letby says she recalled the name of the mother in June 2015. Nicholas Johnson. You have got a good memory for names? Letby. Yes. You carry them in your head? Yeah. 
Would you say you've got a good memory? Yeah. Let B is asked about messages she exchanged with Minna Lapalainen on June 26th, in which she said, quote, What I have seen has really hit me tonight. Mina suggests a counsellor for Let B. Let B, quote, I can't talk about it now. I can't stop crying. The reply suggests Let B take time off and consider if she should be at work during this time. Let B replies she has to keep carrying on working after saying, quote, I just have to let it all out. Nicholas Johnson. This was a very memorable time of your life, wasn't it? Let be. Yes. Messages between Letby and a colleague are exchanged. The colleague said there was something odd about what had happened. Letby is asked if what do you mean was what she really thought as per her response. Nicholas Johnson. Were you worried that people were starting to put two and two together? Letby. No. Letby had messaged, quote, Odd that we lost three in different circumstances. Lucy tells the court the circumstances were different. The colleague, quote, I don't know, were they that different? Ignore me, I'm speculating. The colleague says there was talk of doing a joint post-mortem for three babies who had died. Letby searched for the father of Child D on October the 3rd, 2015. You didn't really forget Child D, did you? Letby. I didn't recall specific details in interview. Mr Johnson says Facebook does not archive the name searches beyond a certain number, so every time Letby searched a name, it would be from memory, and Letby accepts that. Letby says Child D did not have appropriate treatment at the start of her life, and that may have had an impact on her later in life. Nicholas Johnson. The lack of antibiotics early on don't cause an air embolus, do they? Letby replies, no. Letby is asked if Caroline Oakley's notes showed Child D was stable prior to the collapse. Do you accept the evidence that Child D's designated nurse in room one, Caroline Oakley, was on a break when Child D collapsed? Letby says she cannot recall. I cannot say either way because I don't know. Do you want to make any further comment about it? No. Letby accepts that if Caroline Oakley was on a break, the other nurse in room one was herself. Catherine Percival Ward had also given evidence saying Caroline Oakley was on a break. Mr Johnson tells the court. Nicholas Johnson. Do you accept that Caroline Oakley was on a break? Let be. Yes. The neonatal schedule is shown to the court. Mr Johnson says there is nothing for Letby's name between 1am and 1.30, the latter when Child D collapsed. A blood gas record is shown for Child D at 1.14am. Nicholas Johnson. That was done by you, wasn't it? Letby. I don't know. Nicholas Johnson. That's your writing, isn't it? Letby. It could be. Mr Johnson asserts it is. Let be. It looks like my writing, yes. Mr Johnson asked why it isn't signed by her. It's just an oversight, like the next line, which also isn't signed. It's an error. Observations for Child D are shown, including readings at 1.15am, and it is signed by Caroline Oakley. Mr Johnson says Caroline Oakley had told the court she got those details for the 1.15am observation, quote, from the girls. Letby says she does not remember that bit of evidence. Letby says she does not recall who was looking after Child D when Caroline Oakley was on her break. An infusion chart is shown where Child D is given a saline bolus. Letby says the handwriting in the date and time started column is likely to be hers. Did you take the opportunity while Caroline was out to sabotage Child D? No. Mr Johnson says, you were standing over her when the alarms went off, weren't you? I don't recall. Mr Johnson says who the candidates could have been. One of the nurses says she wasn't there in evidence. Another is Catherine Percival Ward and Letby agrees she could have been there. Another nurse is discounted. Letby says she cannot recall if it was her who was in room one. A fluid balance chart is shown to the court with the note quote, Oral secretions plus plus. Letby says the handwriting could be hers. Letby said it could have been something she had documented alongside Caroline Oakley. 
Mr. Johnson suggests Letby was babysitting child D. Letby adds she cannot comment if she had been in nursery room one throughout. The neonatal schedule is shown to the court. Letby denies she has ever falsified paperwork to make it look like she was doing one activity at one time when doing another. The schedule shows Letby was involved in giving medications to child D before the second collapse at 3am. Nicholas Johnson. Do you remember that? Letby. No. An infusion chart for child D is made by Letby and Caroline Oakley at 3.20am. Nicholas Johnson. Child D died because you injected her with air, didn't you? No. No, I did not give her air. Letby said she was looking after other babies, not just child D. Lucy Letby. I tried to be as cooperative as I could be to police in interview. Letby asks for a break. Mr Johnson says he just requires to tidy up something which should take two minutes in the case of child C. He refers to the bereavement checklist. Letby says hand and footprints were taken before death in certain cases. Mr Johnson says the checklist is, quote, for staff following neonatal death. The judge says there will be an early lunch break and the court will resume at 1.45pm. Nicholas Johnson KC, on behalf of the prosecution, asks about the case of Child E. He asks Lucy Letby if it was medical incompetence that led to Child E's death, in that the night shift team could have reacted sooner to the child's bleed. Letby replies, possibly, yes. She says once Child E was bleeding at 10pm, a transfusion could have been made sooner. She says the collective team were responsible. Letby says it was, quote, an important thing to know that plumbing issues were a potential contributory factor to the decline of baby's health in the unit. She said raw sewage would come out of the sinks in nursery room one as flow back from another unit. Mr Johnson asked if Letby ever filled in a Datix form for that. Letby says she did not. Mr Johnson says Letby did fill in a Datix form for child E. The form is shown to the court. It is dated August the 4th, 2015 at 5.53am, which is when the form was signed and filed. It is classed as a, quote, clinical incident. The risk grading was high potential harm. Letby says she is not sure about that, as it also says actual harm, none, no harm caused. It refers to the death of child E at 1.40am. Description, unexpected death following GI bleed. Full recess, unsuccessful. Time of death, 1.40am. The baby's history is recorded in the events leading up to his death. It was filled in by the Instant Review Group panel. Letby's input on the panel is reporting the incident on the first page of the nine-page report. Letby is asked if she remembers sending a text message to her colleague Jennifer Jones-Key saying it was, quote, too quiet on August 2nd, 2015. Letby says she cannot recall, but accepts that would be something she could send. Letby says there is always something to do, but sometimes they can be long night shifts if you haven't got many babies. She says she enjoyed being busy when it was managed. Letby is asked why she, and not Child E's designated nurse Melanie Taylor, signed a correction to a prescription for Child E. Letby says it's standard practice for two nurses to administer prescriptions, and corrections on the form are not based on seniority. She agrees that she was keen to raise issues if they needed correcting. Nicholas Johnson. Had you fallen out with Melanie Taylor by this stage? Letby. No. Letby denies she had fallen out with anyone. She agrees she had confidence in her clinical competencies. Nicholas Johnson. Do you agree you were a cut above some other nurses, including Mel? Let be. No. A nursing note for child E from the evening of August 3rd, 2015 is shown. Let be agrees he was progressing well, although he needed insulin. Let be agrees child E at this stage showed no sign of gastrointestinal problems. A rotor is shown to the court, showing Let be was the designated nurse for child E and death in room one. No other babies, nurses were allocated in that room that night. Letby is asked if there was anything wrong with this arrangement. Letby replies, no. Mr Johnson says when Letby was giving evidence to Mr Myers, her defence barrister, 
She said when the mother arrived at the unit, she was, quote, bringing milk. Letby says she does not recall from her memory. Mr Johnson says that was what she said on May 5th. Letby replies, I can't recall, right here, right now. Letby says she cannot remember it specifically, but accepted that version of events. Quote, I don't have any clear memory. Mr Johnson refers to the transcript from that day, in which Letby told Benjamin Myers Casey she believed Child E's mother had arrived at the unit bringing expressed breast milk. Letby says, I said I think she brought expressed breast milk. Mr Johnson asks about the significance of 9pm that night. Letby replies, I don't know what you mean. Mr Johnson says it's the mother's evidence that she knew Child E was due a feed at 9pm, so came down to the unit for that feed. Mr Johnson says Letby's recollection that Child E's mother brought milk with her fixes the time as being 9pm. Letby replies, I don't agree. Mr Johnson asks about the 16 mil mucky aspirate, which Letby agrees was taken before 9pm. Mr Johnson asks where the milk for the 9pm feed was coming from. Letby says the milk would come from the milk fridge in nursery room 1. She says she does not remember where the milk would come from for this feed specifically. No feed was recorded for 9pm. Mr Johnson says the SHO did not record no feed for 9pm, having said in evidence that would be the sort of thing he would record for a baby. Letby says sometimes doctors don't record such notes. Letby is asked why the large vomit of fresh blood is not recorded on the observation chart for 10pm. Letby says she recorded it in her nursing notes and Dr David Harkness was present when it happened. Letby is asked why she waited over an hour for the observation of the aspirate to be raised with the doctor. Lucy Letby replies, I don't recall speaking to a doctor. Letby does however recall speaking to an SHO about it on the phone. Letby says there was no observation of blood prior to 10pm. Nicholas Johnson. Was Chaldee's mother telling the truth about you? Lucy Letby. In what sense? In the sense of what you said to her. When she says she came down to see her boys, she saw Child E with blood around his lips. Child E's mother's illustration of what she says was present on Child E's lips is shown to the court. Nicholas Johnson. Did you ever see anything like that? Lucy Letby. Child E did have blood like that after 2200. Letby adds there was no blood prior to that. Lebby accepts she was alone in room 1 when the mother came down. She says that would have been around the handover time at 8pm. Nicholas Johnson. You are not telling the truth about that, are you? Lucy Letby. Yes, I am. Letby says she does not accept causing an injury to harm child E. She denies at any stage having a fallout with child E's mother. Letby says she has never seen a baby with blood like that around her mouth in her career. She agrees it was wholly exceptional. She denies telling Child E's mother the cause of the bleed was via insertion of a nasogastrinal tube. Letby is asked if she recalls telling the police in the case of Child N that NG tubes can cause bleeding. Letby says it does cause blood, but not in the mouth. Mr Johnson says Letby has said that previously it can cause oral bleeding. Letby replies, OK. She denies saying that happened in this case. She says, medically speaking, any baby could have a bleed like the sort seen by child E. A text message from Letby to Jennifer Jones Key is shown. Quote, he had a massive hemorrhage that could have happened to any baby. Letby says, at the time, it was thought child E could have NEC and any baby could have had the condition child E had. Letby is asked to look at her defence statement. She says Child E's mother had come down with some expressed milk. The statement is dated February 2021. Letby, in her statement, said, quote, This may have been later than 2100. Mr Johnson says Letby is now ruling out a time before 2200. Letby says she cannot say definitively, but there was no blood prior to 2200. Letby is asked why she did not mention the vomit when blood went down the NG tube in her defence statement. Mr Johnson says Letby is lying by adding additional detail afterwards. Letby denies this. 
Mr Johnson asks about the quote mucky aspirate for child E, asking if that is 16 mil of bile, as per Letby's defence statement. Letby says there was bile in the mucky aspirate. Mr Johnson says there is a difference between bile stained and bile. Letby accepts there was 16 mil of bile in her defence statement and that is an error. She is asked why she put that in, in those terms. Letby replies, I don't know. Letby says this is a clarification of her earlier statement. Nicholas Johnson, you are lying, aren't you? Lucy Letby replies, no. The defence statement also refers to, quote, blood in the nappy for child E after he died. Mr Johnson asks if that has been heard in her evidence. Letby says she cannot recall. Letby says it is written in her nursing notes and nothing was done about it as child E was deceased by that time. Letby is asked to look at her nursing notes. Mr Johnson says Letby's nursing notes for child E, as read by Letby during the break, do not record blood in the nappy. Letby says she could not recall her notes specifically at this time. Mr Johnson reads about what other medical staff observed following child E's collapse. Dr David Harkness recorded for child E's observations following the collapse, quote, kind of strange purple patches that appeared on the outside of his tummy. Letby says it was purple, but not patches. Letby said the other parts were more pale than the pink described by Dr Harkness. Dr Harkness said he'd only ever seen it before with child A. Letby disagrees. She says it was, quote, not the same. Asked to explain the differences between the two, Letby says it was a, quote, solid block of purpleness for child E and a more mottled look for child A. Letby agrees it was over the abdomen, but disagrees the purple patches moved around. Mr Johnson reads through another doctor's observations, who said she had not seen a discoloration, but Dr Harkness was animated when he was describing what he had seen to her. Letby says she was not there for the conversation between the two of them. Letby is asked to read her retrospective nursing note for child E, which described Charles E's collapse and subsequent decline until he died in his parents' arms at 1.40am. The note would have been made with reference to medical notes, Letby tells the court. Letby is asked to look at an observation chart for blood and gas. Letby says when things are going on, it would be standard practice to write also on the back of handover sheets or spare bits of paper. Letby is asked about a purple band of discoloration she had recorded for child E. In her police interview, Letby accepts struggling to recall the size of it at the time. Mr Johnson says for the evidence given on May 5th, Letby said it was a quote, red horizontal banding across his abdomen and only on the abdomen. Letby agrees with Dr Harkness it was on the abdomen, but does not agree with Dr Harkness's observation it was patches. Letby is asked to look at a chart showing aspirates for child E, which included, quote, minimal aspirates prior to the collapse. Letby agrees that showed no signs of gastrointestinal issues for child E until the 9pm reading of 16 mil mucky aspirate in her writing. Letby cannot recall why Belinda Simcock had written in the 10pm aspirates column. Letby assumes the blood came out following those 10pm readings. Why it was Belinda there at all? Letby replies, I can't say for sure. Letby says Belinda had come to assist for the 60 mil aspirate observed an hour earlier. Letby says she cannot say why Belinda was carrying out observations at that time. Letby says she cannot explain why the blood aspirate is not recorded in the aspirate chart but is in her nursing notes. Letby is asked to read a note on the schedule for child E in which it is said Belinda Simcock gave a feed to a child in room 2 at 10pm. Letby says she cannot recall why Belinda Simcock had come to room 1 for the 10pm readings. Mr Johnson asks if Belinda Simcock was brought in to sign paperwork at the time of the collapse to cover for Letby's actions. Letby denies this. Letby said Belinda Simcock had carried out the drip readings for child E and signed it, a specific information like that is not passed on from one nurse to another. Letby is asked if she recalls who rang child E's mother when child E collapsed. 
She said it would have been a collective decision to contact the midwifery staff. Lepi accepts Chaldi's mother made a phone call at 9.11pm, but does not accept the evidence of the conversation about Child E, quote, bleeding from his mouth and there was, quote, nothing to worry about. Benjamin Myers Casey, for Letby's defence, rises to say Letby cannot say what was or what was not said in a phone call she was not a part of. Nicholas Johnson. You killed Child E, didn't you? No. Why in the aftermath were you so obsessed with Child E and F's mother? I don't think I was obsessed. Letby says she often thought of Child E and Child F. Mr. Johnson says the name of child E and F's mother was searched for nine times and the name of the father once. Let be said she searched to see how child F was doing. One of the searches was when child F was on the neonatal unit. Let be said that other searches were made after child F had left the unit, so collectively what she said was correct. Mr. Johnson says Let be was looking for the family's reaction. Let be disagrees. One of the searches is on Christmas Day. Nicholas Johnson. Didn't you have better things to do? Let be said the family were on her mind. Mr Johnson tells the court he is now looking at the case of Child G. He will go out of sequence chronologically and deal with Child F at a later point. Let be says she cannot recall what Child G's due date would have been. Child G having been born at a gestational age of 23 weeks and 6 days on May the 31st, with the date of one of those events not standing out to her. A message from Letby's phone to a colleague, quote, Due date today, exclamation mark. Letby says she knew back then at the time, September the 21st, 2015. Letby says the date of the event for Child G was a coincidence. Letby says Child G had extreme prematurity, which had complications requiring additional care. Letby disagrees that Child G was fine by the time she came to the Countess of Chester Hospital, saying she had a number of ongoing issues. Letby denies that Child G was ready to go home by the date of the first event on September 7th, saying babies in the special care room Nursery 4 can still be there for several weeks. Letby says Child G had a number of previous problems, including relating to feeding and had sepsis. Letby says Child G was on oxygen and had feeding issues by September the 7th, 2015. Mr Johnson asks Letby to look at Child G's nursing records for her days leading up to her projectile vomit. Letby agrees there is nothing unusual in those days. Feeding charts are shown for Child G for September 5th and 6th. Child G is being fed expressed breast milk via the NGT or bottle. Letby agrees the picture is looking good for Child G from these charts. Mr Johnson says the feed at 11pm on September 6th would not have been done twice by mistake. Letby says she has never suggested that has happened. Letby agrees the observations for Child G before 2am on September 7th are quote good. Nicholas Johnson you knew this was day 100 of Child G's life, didn't you? Let be. Yes. It was a big day for her. Let be. Yes. Let be agrees she and other nurses would celebrate 100 day old babies on the unit and a banner had been prepared to mark the occasion. A staffing rotor for the night shift of September 6th, 7th is shown to the court. Let be is in room 1 as the designated nurse for one baby and Elsa Simpson is the designated nurse for one other baby in room 1. A nursing colleague is in room 2 as a designated nurse for child G. Let B rules out staffing levels or staffing competence as a contributory factor to child G's death. Asked if anyone had made a mistake, Let B says potentially child G had been overfed by a nursing colleague, but that was not what she was saying had happened. Let B quote, I can't say for definite that didn't happen. I'm not saying she did do that, but it is a possibility. Letby says it is a possibility the amount of milk was mismeasured when calculating the feed. Nicholas Johnson. Are you suggesting it's a realistic possibility? Letby. No. Nicholas Johnson KC continues to cross-examine Lucy Letby in the case of Child G. 
Letby says it was a possibility Child G was overfed by a nursing colleague, but adds, quote, I don't believe that happened. Mr Johnson says to overfeed Child G twice as much would have taken twice as long. Letby says 45 mils of milk feed would take around 15 to 20 minutes. Letby refers to medical experts Dr Evans and Dr Bowen that overfeeding was a possibility. Mr Johnson describes what Letby had seen, including that Child G's abdomen was firm and red, with the sight of that and vomit on the floor leaving her shocked. That was a clear recollection you had last week, giving evidence. Letby says that happened at approximately 2.15am. Her nursing note is shown to the court, quote, Child G had large projectile milky vomit at 02.15, continued to vomit plus plus, 45 mils of milk obtained from NG tube with air plus plus. Abdomen noted to be distended and discoloured. Colour improved few minutes after aspirating tube, remained distended but soft. To go nil by mouth with IV fluids. Letby says she disagrees with the evidence of Dr Sandy Bowen, saying a pH reading of 4 can be obtained from milk aspirated from the stomach. A photo of Child G's cot with circles marking where the vomit fell outside of the cot is shown to the court. Letby is asked to look at her police interview for Child G. Letby said it was in her cot. Nicholas Johnson. This was an extraordinary vomit, the likes of which you had not seen in your career. Letby. I have, but not in neonates. Letby says it's an oversight she had not mentioned the extent of the vomit in police interview. Letby says Child G was still vomiting when she went to see Child G with Elsa Simpson. Nicholas Johnson. You were not there with her, were you? Letby. Yes, I was. Letby is asked to look at her police interview. She says at the time of the vomit she did not remember where she was, then went into the room where Child G was. Letby is asked why there is no mention of Elsa Simpson in the interview. Letby says she was describing her own response. The neonatal schedule is shown to the court for Child G. Mr Johnson says Letby deliberately misstated the time at which Child G had her vomit at 2.15am and says it was different. Letby disagrees. Mr Johnson refers to Dr Allison Ventress's notes, quote, Call to RV, child G at 2.35. He says that is an accurate time, and Letby had misstated the time so Letby's colleague could instead be blamed for overfeeding, and Letby instead had overfed child G. Letby replies, that's not true. Mr Johnson asks where the air came from before neopuffing. Letby says she cannot say without looking at the nursing notes. Letby's notes quote, 45 mils of milk obtained from NG tube with air plus plus. The note does not mention neopuffing. Letby says that is an oversight. Mr Johnson, the truth is that you injected child G with milk and air, didn't you? Letby replies, no. Letby is asked to look at her second police interview for Child G. In it, Letby said air had got through the feeding syringe. She tells the court it had been suggested to her as a possibility. Mr Johnson refers to Child G's 3.15am collapse, with Dr Allison Ventress recalling blood-stained fluid coming up. Letby denies inserting something into Child G's airway and or causing the deterioration. Dr Ventress and a doctor colleague said, quote, 100 ml of air milk had been aspirated from Child G following the 6.05am desaturation. Letby says she does not recall 100 ml coming out and asks if it was documented. Dr Allison Ventress's note is shown to the court. It includes, quote, NG aspirated as abdo appeared very large, 100 ml aspirated. Letby, quote, I don't know how the air got there. It's after neopuffing. She accepts the notes as an account of what happened. Letby is shown nursing notes made for the following day shift by a colleague. Letby agrees there are no signs Child G had a build-up of fluid or air from the notes made. Mr Johnson refers to the second bout of vomiting on September 21, 2015. 
Letby said she thought she recalled the mother was there, as it was during visiting time. Letby had said she did not believe it was an emergency and did not recall Child G going blue. Asked if she agrees with Child G's father that Child G was, quote, not the same after the first deterioration, Letby replies, I can't comment on that. Nobody knows their babies like the parents do. Mr Johnson asks why Letby was giving Child G the 9.15am feed on September the 21st. Letby replies, she wasn't awake and she was due her immunisations. Letby says, feeding-wise, she had no concerns with Child G. She said there was an ongoing issue with Child G's low temperature. For that September the 21st day shift, the court is shown the rotor. Lucy Letby was the designated nurse for Child G that day in room 4, along with two other babies. Lucy Letby was also responsible for a fourth baby rooming in with parents. Nicholas Johnson. Did it annoy you that you were in nursery room 4? Letby. Not at all. Mr Johnson says that Letby, when giving evidence, said aspirating can interrupt digestion. Letby replies, when fully aspirating, that can happen. She tells the court on this occasion, NGT feeds would be preferable for babies receiving immunisations as they can be quite unwell after them and they may need rest. The court is shown a feeding chart for child G. A 40ml feed of expressed breast milk was given at 9.15am signed by Letby. After the feed, there were 30ml, two projectile milk vomits, Letby noted. Child G also had a large bowel motion, loose, watery green, and there was a review by doctors. The note is again signed by Letby. She says she cannot recall which doctors carried out the review from that note. The 9am reading is recorded on the observation chart for the temperature. Mr Johnson suggests there are two dots in that column recording temperatures. Letby says she cannot recall what the line is below the dot. Nicholas Johnson. Did you go back and cook the charts to make it look like Child G was declining? Letby replies, no. Letby says both dots are in the normal range. Letby says, I haven't misdocumented anything. Two dots are recorded in the 3am column when Letby was not on shift. Letby suggests someone else has misdocumented. Letby's notes for that day are shown to the court. They include, quote, At 10.15, two large projectile milky vomits, brief self-resolving apnea and desaturation to 35% with colour loss. NG tube aspirated, 30 mils undigested milk discarded, abdomen distended, soft. Doctors asked to review. Temperature remains low. Tachycardic, 18 beats per minute since vomit. Mr Johnson says it's not an innocent coincidence that Child G deteriorated one hour after being fed by Letby. Letby replies, yes, it is. Letby is asked to look at her defence statement. It included, quote, I did not shout for help as I did not think it was an emergency. Letby is asked if she sought to minimise what had happened. Letby replies, no. Mr Johnson refers to Dr Peter Fielding's note. It says... Child G had an episode at 10.20 where she had two projectile vomits witnessed by nursing staff. Nurse called for help. Letby denies minimising events, saying this was a self-correcting event for Child G. Letby sent in a text to a work colleague, quote, Looked rubbish when I took over this morning and then she vomited at 9 and I got her screened. Mr Johnson says that text has two lies in it. Let me accept she got the time wrong, but says she was not asked about Child G's colour. Mr Johnson says Child G was doing well. Mr Johnson shows a nursing colleague's note from the previous night shift, and Letby's nursing note from that day shift. Quote, any suggestion Child G was looking rubbish? Letby says Child G looked pale, but didn't use rubbish in clinical notes. Let me deny deliberately falsifying times or making up negative observations for child G. Let me deny passing off responsibility to other people as suggested by Mr Johnson. Nicholas Johnson. In fact, you are the person causing all these problems. Lucy Letby. No, I am not. Mr Johnson asks Letby to look at her defence statement for the 3.30pm incident for child G. Letby said she looked round the screen and saw Child G's monitor was off, she was alone and behind the screen. 
Mr. Johnson asks if that was correct. Letby replies, yes. The statement adds, Letby wanted the matter of Chalji being left alone on the procedural trolley behind the screens by a doctor brought to attention, but a nursing colleague did not want to report this. Letby agrees it was an innocent coincidence that she was the only nurse in the room at this time. Mr Johnson said Letby had told in evidence that Letby was preoccupied with other babies in the room she was caring for, while doctors tried to cannulate child G behind screens for some time. The court is shown a neonatal schedule for child G and other babies for September the 21st. Letby is recorded as having free duties for other babies in the 90 minutes prior to child G's collapse. One of the free events was for a differently designated nurse's baby in room 2. Letby says that does not mean she was not preoccupied with other babies and may have been dealing with their families or other duties. Letby is asked about the event and her looking behind the screen, that child G was, quote, dusky, blue and not breathing. Letby is asked if that was true. She replies, yes. Letby agrees she picked child G up, put her in a cot and neopuffed her. She says the neopuff equipment would not stretch to the trolley. A nursing colleague froze and went to get a separate nursing colleague. Letby said in evidence she was very concerned by what had happened. Mr Johnson says one thing not mentioned in the defence statement was Letby moving child G from the trolley to the cot. He asks why Letby had not mentioned that. Letby says she cannot say. Mr Johnson says Letby took advantage of a situation that presented itself. Letby replies, no. Mr Johnson says when the cannulation process was taking place, Letby must have been in the room. Letby says she would not have been there all the time. One of the charts is shown for a baby that Letby was looking after, with the chart requiring readings that took about five minutes to make. Letby says she was in and out of the nursery all day, on activities that did not require being cotside. She says she does not recall at any point being told by doctors they had finished with the cannulation process for child G. Letby says it would have been up to the doctors to remove the screens and make sure child G was safely back in her cot following the cannulation. Mr Johnson moves on to the case of child H. Letby says she does recall child H due to the chest drains that were in place. Letby said chest drains had to be couriered from Arrow Park Hospital it was unacceptable that they didn't have sufficient supplies at the Countess of Chester Hospital. Mr Johnson asks if Letby filled in a Datix form for that. Letby says she does not recall. Letby is asked about the text message she sent to Yvonne Griffiths on September 26, 2015, which said, quote, Thank you, that's really nice to hear, as I gather you are aware of some of the not-so-positive comments that have been made recently regarding my role, which I have found quite upsetting. Our job is a pleasure to do and just hope I do my best for the babies and their family. The court hears this was with regard to Letby and colleague Shelley Tomlins being allocated shifts in room one over other nurses who needed the experience. Letby says she cannot recall which nurses specifically had been making those comments, but they were band six nurses. Letby agrees this message followed events for child H. Mr Johnson refers to the staffing rotor for September the 25th and 26th. Letby says it was not the night shift who were making the comments. Mr Johnson asks if it was the day shift, why did they allocate child H to Letby? Letby replies the comments had come in recent days prior to this. Letby, in her defence statement, questioned how familiar the doctors were with chest drains. Letby, when questioned on this, says this would be non-consultants. In her defence statement, Letby said she could not recall the specific details of child H's collapses. Letby is asked to refer to her defence statement in which she said her memory for both nights when child H collapsed merged into one. Letby added she was also looking after a severely disabled baby. Letby now accepts the disabled baby was born later in the shift. Letby tells the court staffing levels were not a contributory factor in child H's collapses. Letby said she would question whether the chest drains were securely put in for child H as a potential contributory factor in child H's collapses. Nicholas Johnson KC is continuing to cross-examine Lucy Letby on child H. Letby is asked if staffing issues contributed to child H's collapse. She says no, 
but believes the management of the chest drains was a contributory factor. Lucy Letby. I believe it has been accepted throughout the trial that there were issues with the chest drains. Letby said the location of the chest drains on Child H may have been a factor and that Child H's pneumothoraces were not treated correctly due to a lack of experience and nobody seemed particularly confident on managing the number of chest drains. She says that was down to multiple doctors. Asked who those would be, Letby said that would include Dr Ravi Jayram, Dr David Harkness, Dr John Gibbs and Dr Alison Ventress. Letby says she had dealt with chest drains in Liverpool but not at the Countess of Chester Hospital. She says she did not have much experience and had a nursing colleague to assist her in the care of child H. Letby is asked about the time between 8pm and 2am on September 25th, 26th. She says she cannot recall specifically the assistance she had from a nursing colleague that night but she was there on and off and gave me a lot of verbal advice that night in the management of Child H's chest drains and on baptism after the collapse of Child H. Mr Johnson reads from Child H's father's statement. He refers to being at the unit until about midnight and was woken up from home in the early hours. Letby's nursing note is shown to the court. It includes times two chest drains in situ at start of shift, intermittently swinging. Serous fluid plus plus accumulating. 23.30, bradycardia and desaturation requiring Neopuff in 100% to recover. 10 mil air aspirated from chest drain by Reg Ventress. Inserted a third chest drain. Mr Johnson says Letby misrepresented the time of this event. Letby tells the court she would have got that time from her notes written at the time. An intensive care chart is shown to the court. It includes, for 2200 hours, 2210 DSAT, SHO present, serous fluid plus plus, times 2 drain. Letby says she cannot recall which SHO was on duty that night. Mr Johnson says the SHO on duty was Jessica Scott and she has not recorded a note saying she was present at that time. Another note, quote, Brady DSAT 2330, 10 mil aspirated from drain. Other details are plus clear in the OP row and plus small blood stained in the suction ET row. Mr Johnson says this is another child producing blood in Letby's care. Letby says this blood has likely come from the ET tube in the lungs. She denies moving it around to destabilise child H. Letby accepts that a 52% desaturation is a potentially serious event. She says, I don't agree, to the suggestions she has cooked the books in her nursing notes. She denies falsifying notes for Child H by giving the impression Child H was deteriorating prior to the collapse. Letby is asked why the 52% desaturation is not in her nursing note. She replies, not every single thing gets written down. That is an error on my part. Letby says that SHO was present from that earlier desaturation. Let be denies writing in the intensive care chart after Child H's collapse. Nicholas Johnson. You're making this up as you go along, aren't you? Letby replies, no. Mr Johnson says Child H's father's statement, which was agreed evidence, did not mention a collapse or an SHO being present. Letby, however, denies lying. Dr Alison Ventress records a note for Child H timed at 11.50pm. It begins, quote, several episodes of desaturation in past two hours. First one after gas taken became agitated. Mr Johnson says Letby told this information to Dr Ventress. Letby says she did not know if she told her this information. She may have been present in the room. Dr Ventress adds, further episodes, no change in heart rate recovered with bagging. Oxygen requirement down to 30% between episodes. Letby denies trying it on or falsely creating the impression to Dr Ventress that Child H had been having problems for a couple of hours. Mr Johnson says the notes on the observation chart and Letby's nursing notes don't match. Mr Johnson asks if this is an innocent coincidence and Letby agrees. An observation chart for Child H is shown for September 25th, 26th. Letby is asked if the results show any concern up to midnight. Letby replies, 
This, the observations taken, reflects that specific moment in time and says that chart shows no concerns with all readings in the normal range. Dr Ventress added in her 11.50pm note, second chest drain advanced back into 4cm as was almost out, done prior to chest x-ray. Letby is asked why she had not noticed that. Letby says medical staff put drains in and managing them was not part of her nursing role. She accepts she knew chest drains were more secure when stitched in rather than taped in. She says she was checking the chest drains. She denies removing the chest drain to cause a desaturation just after Child H's father left. Mr Johnson asks about Letby's error, as mentioned in her evidence, about the timing of the blood transfusion being completed. Letby said on May 15th, the 0200 blood transfusion completed should read 3am. Letby says she has miswritten it from looking at the charts. A blood infusion therapy chart is shown in Letby's writing, which has in the time-ended column what appears to be 0205 corrected to 0305. Nicholas Johnson. The same mistake in two different places. What happened after 0305? Lucy Letby. I don't recall. Really? Child H had a cardiac arrest. Letby is asked how on earth she made the 0205 error. Letby replies, because we're human people, we make mistakes. Letby says the error is mine on the nursing notes, but the timings were otherwise accurate. Letby says she cannot remember Child H's father being present. The father recalled mottling running out of her skin towards her fingers. Letby says she agrees there was mottling on Child H's skin, but not that it was moving. A blood gas chart for September 26th is shown to the court for child H. Letby agrees the reading at 6.44am is a good blood gas reading. Mr Johnson says child H had had a miraculous recovery. Letby replies, yes. Nicholas Johnson, were you pleased? Of course I was pleased. Or were you frustrated that you had failed in your attempt to kill her? No. The second event is being discussed. For the night of September 26th, 27th, Lucy Letby was the designated nurse for two babies in room two. Nurse Christopher Booth was the designated nurse for child G in room two, and Nurse Shelley Tomlins was the designated nurse for child H in room one. Elizabeth Marshall is the designated nurse for four babies in room three, including child I. The court hears a seriously ill baby was brought into the unit during the night. The court hears Letby in her evidence to defence on May 15th said she did not have much to do with child H on the night shift. Letby said she was reliant on medical notes as she did not recall with any great detail that night for child H. Dr Matthew Neem was the registrar that night with Dr Jessica Scott the night SHO. Letby accepts she had got confused in her defence statement between the events of this night and the previous one. She rules out staffing levels as a contribution in Child H's deterioration. She says she cannot comment on medical incompetencies as she was not Child H's designated nurse and was not present for much of the shift, and rules out a doctor or nurse making mistakes. Letby is asked if she was involved in an event timed at 9.15pm for Child H, who had a desaturation and bradycardia. Letby said she did not remember. Dr Neem, in evidence, said, quote, ETT removed by nursing staff, and that nurse was Letby alone. Lucy Letby replies, well, I don't have any recollection of that. A text is shown from Letby to a colleague at 9.51pm, quote, I've been helping Shelley, so Lee's still involved but haven't got the responsibility. Letby says she does not agree she would have removed an ET tube by herself. The neonatal schedule shown for 9 to 10 p.m. shows no duties for child H for which Letby has been named as the nurse. Letby is asked about what she had been helping Shelley with, as per her text message. She says she had been helping with child H. She denies taking an opportunity to sabotage child H. Nurse Shelley Tomlin's note for 9.45 p.m. is shown. The court is shown Nurse Tomlin's note for that shift, which include, quote, Around 2030, Child H had profound DSAT and Brady. 
air entry no longer heard and capnography negative, therefore ETT removed and doctors crash bleeped. New ETT sighted on second attempt. Copious secretions obtained via ETT and orally blood stained. 2145, desaturation to 40% despite good air entry and positive capnography. ETT suctioned quickly with thick blood stain secretions noted. Child H recovered quickly after. Let B denies altering Child H's ET tube to cause bleeding. Mr Johnson asks if Letby was bored with the children she was looking after in room 2 prior to Child H's collapse. Letby replies, no. She denies she had time on her hands. At 12.45am on September 27th, Letby is recorded as liking a post on Facebook. At 12.46am, she liked a Facebook photo posted by a colleague. Letby says she may have been on her break at this point. Mr Johnson says Letby was involved in a fluid balance chart for one of her designated babies around that time. Letby replies, yes, at 1am. Child H's father's statement is read to the court, in which he said quite late on Saturday, September 26th, he went to rest and was woken up shortly afterwards to get to Child H's bedside. Letby denies using the time the father was away as an opportunity to attack Child H. Lucy Letby. No, I've never attacked any child. Letby says she couldn't say if she was covering for Shelley Tomlins at 1am. An observation chart is shown for child H for September 26th, 27th. Hourly observations are made between 8pm and 4am, except for 1am. Crash call bleep data is made at 1.04am and 1.06am for child H. Mr Johnson says Dr Neem gave evidence to say when he arrived, Letby was present. Nicholas Johnson. Is that right? Lucy Letby. I can't say, from memory. You were there, weren't you? I can't say exactly where I was, from memory. Letby denies making an alibi at 1am for the fluid balance chart for her designated baby. Lucy Letby. That's me giving cares to the baby I was allocated. Nurse Shelley Tomlin's record, written at 3.49am for the 3.30am desaturation, quote, 0330, profound desaturation to 60s, again requiring neopuffing with no known cause for desat. Copious amounts of secretions yielded orally pink-tinged. Small amount of ET secretions gained, again pink-tinged. Heart rate mainly normal during desat, recovered slowly. Letby denies interfering with Child H's ET tube. Letby says she is helping Shelley Tomlins after the desaturation. Nicholas Johnson. Why is it always you that ends up in nursery room one? Lucy Letby. I don't agree it's always me. Mr Johnson moves on to the case of Child I. Letby agrees she remembers Child I very well. Mr Johnson says this is another case where you falsified her records. Letby is asked to look at her defence statement. She said Child I's stomach, quote, bloated regularly and all the nursing staff were aware of it. Letby said, quote, nothing was ever done about the concerns with Child I's bowel. Letby said she was one of those raising concerns that she was not getting the treatment she needed. The defence statement adds Letby did recall one handover to nurse Bernadette Butterworth that Child I desaturated and became apneic and she assisted in care thereafter. Letby, when asked, rules out staffing levels as a problem that led to Child Eye's deterioration on September 30th. For September 30th, Letby was looking after Child Eye and two other babies in room 3 on her long day shift. Letby rules out medical incompetencies or mistakes made by medical staff that led to Child Eye's collapse on September 30th. Letby is asked to look at Child Eye's medical records from September 26th to 29th and observations early on Letby's shift on September 30th. Letby agrees Child Eye was stable at this time. A temperature of 36.1 C is recorded for Child Eye at 11am and the hot cot temperature was turned up. Letby denies by this time she had fallen out with medical colleagues Ashley Hudson, Melanie Taylor and one other. The ward round posted a positive picture for Child I on September 30th. Let B agrees. 
Child Eye was due her immunisations, as noted on the ward round. Mr Johnson says this positive picture was similar to Child G, when Child G was about to have her immunisations. Mr Johnson asked what became an obstacle to that. Letby replies it was Child Eye vomiting and having to be transferred to Room 1. A feeding chart is shown for Child Eye for September 30th. Mum fed and gave cares at 10am. The note is signed by Letby. At 1pm, a 35ml feed was given via the NG tube, which had a 5ml aspirate. Letby says the 5ml aspirate is a very minimal amount. At 4pm, a further 35ml feed is given via the NG tube. On both occasions, child eye was asleep. At 4.30pm, quote, large vomit plus apnea. N1 transfer to nursery 1. Letby is asked about child eye's mother's routine. Letby says she cannot call specifically. She adds the mother would visit the unit regularly. Mr Johnson suggests Letby knew the family so well through the frequent visits that she got to know their routine when they would be in and out of the unit. Letby replies, I don't agree. Dr Lisa Beebe's notes shows she was asked to review child eye due to a low temperature. The note adds, quote, Mum reports low temperature has been happening over past few days. The note concludes, monitor closely. If further concerns for sepsis, screen but appears clinically well at present. Letby says she does not recall the conversation. She does not recall, as the prosecution suggests, telling the doctor one concern low temperature and the mother another of the abdomen. She denies providing a cover and says she did not monitor child eye closely as noted on the doctor's plan. Letby says she first monitored Child Eye's vital signs at 3pm. She said the concern raised with the doctor was Child Eye having a low temperature, and she had adjusted that by raising the hot cot temperature. Mr Johnson suggests that monitor closely would mean more observations. Letby replies, I disagree. Letby is asked how long the 1pm 35ml feed with thickener as listed on the chart would take to administer. She agrees it would take roughly 15 minutes. Letby's nursing note, written at 1.36pm, is shown to the court. Quote, three times eight feeds EBM, two bottles to one NG tube, abdomen appears full and slightly distended, soft to touch, child eye straining plus plus. Bowels have been opened. Mum feels it is more distended to yesterday and that child eye is quiet. Appears generally pale. Doctors asked to review to continue with current plan. Letby says, we monitor all our babies closely, in response to why Dr Beeb has said monitor closely instead of do what you normally do. Mr Johnson, this is yet another example of you writing nursing notes for something that didn't happen. Lucy Letby, I don't agree. Letby denies cooking the notes to show child eye was deteriorating prior to her collapse. An observation chart for child eye is shown for September 30th. Hourly observations are made for 10am to 1pm and 3pm to the rest of the day. Letby says there is no reason why the 2pm observation is not made. Letby is asked which doctor reviewed child eye at 3pm. Letby names one doctor and believes it was the one doctor who reviewed. Mr Johnson says there is no medical note in relation to this. Letby, however, denies making it up. Mr Johnson asks Letby why the bottle bottle NGT feed system is interrupted by bottle NGT NGT. Letby says the 4pm second NGT feed was as child eye was asleep. Letby denies falsely recording notes for when child eye had bowel movements during the day. Mr Johnson says a doctor's notes does not note a prior examination. Letby denies making up the examination in her notes. She adds, quote, just because it's not there doesn't mean it didn't take place. Mr Johnson says Letby is very keen to raise doctors' mistakes, with the likes of Dr Harkness and Dr Gibbs, but not in this case. Lucy Letby. I don't believe this was noted at the time. My priority was child eye, not medical notes. You force-fed child eye, didn't you? No, I didn't. Letby says Child Eye did not wake for that feed, so an NGT feed was given as standard practice.
Mr Johnson says, despite all the positive signs for child I, she vomited, just like child G, and in both cases, Letby was there. Letby says she does not recall if she was there when child I vomited. A medical report for child I stated, there is splinting of the diaphragm due to bowel distension. Letby denies pumping child I full of milk or air. Letby says, I fed child I the normal dose of milk for her feed. A blood gas chart for child I is shown. The chart had not been noted up by Letby and it was found on a clipboard. It was signed by Bernadette Butterworth for Letby. Letby says the chart was not hidden, it was there for anyone to see. Mr Johnson talks about the 7.30pm event for child I. Letby's notes add, At 19.30 child I became apneic, abdomen distended and firm. Bradycardia and desaturation followed. SHO in attendance and registrar crash called. Air aspirated from NG tube. Child I is now very pale and quiet. Let be denies forcing air into child I. Observations for child I for the remainder of September 30th are shown to the court. Bernadette Butterworth's nursing notes state, During handover, child I abdo had become more distended and hard. She had become apneic and bradycardic. Sats had dropped. IPPV given and despite a good seal with Neopuff, there was still no chest movement. Aspirated NGT air plus 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 and two mils of milk obtained. Eventually got chest movement and sats and heart rate normalised. Mr Johnson talks about the second event for child I, which was on the night of October 12th-13th when Letby said she was standing in the doorway when she could see child I looked pale and the lights were turned up. Letby says the lighting was on in that room, so child I could be seen prior to the lights being turned up. Letby is asked to look at her defence statement. She recalls Ashley Hudson was quite inexperienced to be looking after child I. Letby said child I required very close monitoring, and adds that, looking back, Ashley had stopped monitoring her when she should have been. Asked to explain where that instruction to monitor child I came from, Letby says it was policy that child I should have been monitored as she come off antibiotics sometime in the previous 48 hours. Letby adds, I'm not saying Ashley made a mistake. Mr Johnson says there had been at least 48 hours since child I had gone off antibiotics before the event occurred. Letby is asked in what way Ashley Hudson was inexperienced. Letby replies, I don't think Ashley had a lot of experience in recognising changes in babies, potentially. Letby says the more experience you have, the more you can detect changes, such as changes in colour in a baby. Letby tells the court she does not recall a reason why she went into room two with Ashley Hudson. In her defence statement, Letby said as they entered the room, they turned the light up on the light dimmer switch and they saw the child looking pale. They went to assist. Child I was gasping and the alarm had not gone off. Let B rules out staffing levels, medical incompetencies or staffing mistakes as a cause of Child I's desaturation on October 12th-13th. A nursing shift rotor is shown for October 12th-13th with Lucy Let B in room 1, designated nurse for one baby. Ashley Hudson was designated nurse for three babies in room 2, including Child G and Child I. Let me repeat, there was no issue with staffing ratios to babies cared for for that night. Let me agrees with the evidence provided by Ashley Hudson, saying that child I was doing well, prospering, and that the level of care had been scaled back. Before the collapse, child I was in air and on bottle feeds. Let me says she has no memory if Ashley Hudson, as said in evidence, left room two to help colleague Laura Eagles in room one. Letby says she had a baby in room 1 and cannot recall who was to look after nursery 2. In evidence, she said she was not the nurse called to room 2. Letby said very quickly she had noticed and saw child I was pale. Letby is asked why she was at room 2. She replies there was nothing sinister about that, that she had been in a chat with a colleague. Nicholas Johnson. The lights were off, weren't they? Letby. I can't say. Letby is asked to look at her police interview. In it, she says she had taken over child I's care as Ashley Hudson had been quite junior. For the observation of child I, she replied the lights were off at night and then they put the lights on, adding she could see child I, quote, 
I noticed that she was pale in the cot. Letby, asked why she had told the jury the lights were never off, says the lights are never off completely, they are turned up. A second police interview has Letby saying, quote, We put the lights on. The lights aren't on in the nursery at night. Asked why she did not refer to a dimmer switch in her police interview, Letby says, I don't know. Nicholas Johnson. Are you trying to massage the evidence by now saying the lights were on low? Letby replies, no. What effect does going from a bright corridor looking into a darkly dimly lit room have on your eyesight? Letby replies, I don't know. You really don't know? No. Everybody knows, don't they? Um, you wouldn't be able to see as well? Mr Johnson says Letby was able to see straight away as she had caused child eyes deterioration. Letby responds, no. The photo of the cot as shown previously is displayed. Do you agree it is accurate? Letby, no, there would be more light visible. The cot would potentially be nearer to the light. I think it was nearer to the workbench than that. Mr Johnson asks how big child eye's hands would be. Letby says they would be small. Mr Johnson says child eye would be almost entirely obscured. Letby replies, just her hands and her face. Nicholas Johnson, which would be covered by that tentacle structure. Letby, not entirely, no. Mr Johnson asks how Letby could spot something Ashley Hudson could not, as mentioned from her police interview. Letby, I had more experience, so I knew what I was looking for. At. What do you mean, looking for? I don't mean it like that. I'm, I'm finding it hard to concentrate. So that concludes day five in the cross-examination in court of the nurse Lucy Letby. If you are new to the channel and you wish to keep up to date with all of the latest developments concerning the case of Lucy Letby, don't forget to hit the subscribe button down below. As always, many thanks for joining me for this video. I look forward to seeing you all again for the next one. Take care. Cheers.